Good morning and thank you for joining us. We begin with ongoing breaking news coming out of Nigeria. At least 118 people have been killed as twin car bombs exploded at a crowded bus terminal and market in Nigeria's central city of Jos. The first blast was in a busy market, the second outside a nearby hospital. And no group has said it was behind the attack. But Boko Haram militants have carried out a spate of recent bombings in the area. For more on this developing story, we are joined by Channel One Senior Foreign Affairs Editor Oren Nahari. Good morning, Oren. Thank Hello, you for joining good morning. us. So, of course, then, Nigeria is in the news because of the 200 girls that have been abducted, but this is not anything new. Terrorism is not new to the area yes, in and, Nigeria. And the activities of Boko Haram, of course, are not new. It's uh, almost a decade now. But the point is that uh, Jos, first of all, is a sort of a, an, an, a frontier town. It's uh, right in the center of the, of the country, uh, on the front between the south, who is Christian, and the north, who is Muslim, very roughly speaking. And uh, again, Boko Haram, but uh, if it is they, and they, probably it is, they show that they are not only some isolated group within the jungles of the northeast of the country, they are capable of carrying out uh, terror attacks. They can use bombs, they can use them at, uh, in towns, not only in the bush areas. So this is the worrying thing about uh, this uh, attack. And a little, uh, a little bit about Boko Haram, because uh, we don't know yet if it is be them behind the, the, the attack. But they have gained in, in, in strength, at least, in the, in the recent years. But there are many copycat groups in the area because, as you said, it's like this frontier town, uh, yes. underdeveloped. And, and the president himself hasn't really you know, visited it and done much in that area. Yes, well, the, well, as to the actions or inactions of the president and the government of Nigeria, volumes can be spoken about right. this. But uh, Boko Haram is very similar, if you will, uh, if you, uh, to the Taliban. They were born in the madrasas or the equivalent of the madrasas in Nigeria. Their slogan, their name is Western education is wrong, is a sin, exactly like the Taliban who fights against Western education, against Western way of thought against Western democracy, against Western everything. And this is exactly the copycat of the Taliban in its, in its beginnings, mm -hmm. uh, before it took control of Afghanistan and may, maybe even today. And this is their goal. Their goal is, and, and it's an anathema, I mean, it's not a thing that we've seen even from Al-Qaeda, even from Taliban, to kidnap Christian girls and to convert them forcefully into Islam. It is something that is not done, but obviously it is done uh, by them. And uh, perhaps, perhaps, and I'm trying to be optimistic mm -hmm. here, that this thing is one step too many. I mean, uh, without being a cynic, terror attacks we've seen, we've heard, we, we go, oh, we said, okay, another terror attack in Joss or whatever. But the kidnapping, this, this brash action of kidnapping and forcefully converting them, perhaps it'll be the one step too many who will force the world, force the African Union, force Nigerian government into action until this is rooted. That's exactly the next uh, and final uh, question I want to ask you about this. Is Boko Haram the actual uh, abduction of these 200 girls? It was uh, maybe a little too much that needed to be done in order for the world to actually look in and see what was happening. And, and we said, of course, about Jonathan, uh, good luck, the president. Uh, another, uh, good luck, Jonathan. Uh, it hasn't done much in, in order to even deal with Boko Haram. Yes. And this is what had to happen in order for the world to look in. Maybe is, is even the media uh, at fault here for not even uh, covering this until 200 girls were abducted? The media, well, the media is, is, is a big word. There's all, all sorts of media. I mean, I, as a, as a presenter of the International Hour in Kol Israel, we've dealt with Boko Haram many times, and also in Mali and the Central African Republic. But these are places that is very hard to bring cameras to, to interview mm -hmm. people, to show face. And uh, the media needs faces and needs an, a, a, an event to focus on, and, uh, and not just uh, things that are happening uh, out there. So perhaps this is the thing. And again, when we are talking about the world, we are really talking about the West. Right. Russia and China, and we'll talk about them later, right. the two cynic superpowers, they don't do anything. They don't say anything. They are not involved. When we go for moral uh, standing, when we go to sending troops, we go again and again to Britain, to France, to the United States, first and foremost, they are the ones that we expect them right, uh, to do something. Right, because and humanitarian interventions of in the past. We're going to go uh, quickly to our next topic. Uh, yesterday morning, of course, the citizens of Thailand woke up to unannounced martial law imposed on them in the middle of the night. However, the military has denied it is staging a coup, claiming that the army is just trying to restore order after months of political unrest. 
For more on this developing story, we're going to also go to a, a, a report, and we'll chat right after. The streets of Bangkok have seen their fair share of mass demonstrations and deadly clashes. But on Tuesday, the Thai capital experienced a change of atmosphere. Soldiers in military vehicles could be seen patrolling the city center as part of a nationwide martial law. The imposition of martial law is to maintain peace and order in the country, to find a solution without pressure from any faction. According to Army Chief Prayut Chan Ocha, martial law would remain in place until peace and order are restored. He also urged the country's leaders to discuss a resolution to the political crisis. The next step is to try to bring rival parties to talk in peace. There can't be talks if there's no peace, if there's still movements, provocation and instigation towards violence. Both pro- and anti-government demonstrators were directed by the military to stop marching, and 10 television stations were ordered to suspend their broadcasting, including both anti-government channel Blue Sky and its pro-government rival Asia Update. According to officials, the government was not included in the decision, and the army's move was unilateral. In the streets, anti-government protesters welcomed the new order with support. The country's pro-government movement, also known as the Red Shirts, said they will follow the general's orders, but also warned of a possible coup. If the general does more than implement the martial law, such as staging a military coup, the red shirts will have no choice but to fight this until the end. Perhaps the fear of a coup is justified. Since the end of absolute monarchy in 1932, the country experienced at least 11 military takeovers. But this time, the army insists the move was made only to ensure public safety. Government and military officials met on Tuesday to discuss the meaning of the newly imposed martial law. And provincial governors were also summoned to meet with the army at regional centers. Meanwhile, the biggest questions are, for how long this new status quo will last, and will leaders and protesters from both camps continue to tolerate it? We're now joined via Skype from Wuhan by journalist Hans Boss. Thank you for being, us, for being with us, Hans. Uh, the military says it's not a coup, but nevertheless, martial law is in the streets, and the martial law does give the military uh, power over the civilian government. That is right. They call it the coup light, or a half coup, because nobody knows exactly what the military are going to do now. What, what is the military's aim, though? Because they do want to keep the order, they do want to keep stability, and they don't want Thailand to become a failed state. What can they do without making it, as we say, a coup? Yeah, the problem is that uh, this is Thailand, and uh, the yellow shirts and the red shirts are uh, fighting against each other, and Paiute now tries to bring the two parties together. They will talk today together with and with the government, but uh, Yatuporn, the leader of the Red Shirts, already said that he only wants to talk in a di democratic uh, order and only if uh, the elections will go ahead. And that's exactly what Sutep, the leader of the, Red of the Yellow Shirts, mm -hmm. does not want. Okay, and yep. Hans, uh, just wait here uh, with me on the line. I want to take the questions back here into the studio. The red shirt and the yellow shirts uh, in Thailand or in have been an uh, ongoing problem. We haven't. Uh, it's, yes. it's, it's it's something that has been going on th through the past few years. But there's a fundamental ideological split between the two, and we've seen military coups in the past in Thailand. So if we put the two and two together, this is going to a military coup. E Yes and no. Perhaps not, because the, we are always suspicious and rightfully so to generals who claim that they are taking on the, because of the public order, because and it's only temporarily and they are not staging a coup, and, and lo and behold, there is a coup. But perhaps this is the one time when the army had to step in because there is no other force. We have to remember that there is police, and police was capable of restoring order, but 
but the army is more identified with the yellow shirts and the police is more identified with the red shirts. So now the great problem is that the army claims it's neutral, but as the old and cynical saying goes, okay, you are neutral, but you are neutral in favor of whom? And they are neutral in favor of the establishment of the Bangkok elite, uh, of the yellow shirts. And the great problem is that if there is an election, again, the red shirts, because of numbers, they will win. They are the rural, they are the majority, they mm -hmm. are the poor, and what can be done in Thailand as in everywhere else, there are more poor people than rich people. So the yellow shirts say they do not want elections. They want to topple the government, to be sure, and perhaps that is their prerogative as an opposition, but they do not want a, uh, an, an elections, right. they don't want democracy, they want a government to be appointed, and uh, there is the problem. And they say that they will go on uh, continue to, to keep the streets, they will go on and uh, blockade uh, Bangkok until they get what they want, and the army does not stop them, the police does not stop them, only the red shirts, so there is growing and growing anger within the rural areas, and we'll see what uh, develops there. There is a huge problem. And Hans, can you give us uh, an idea of the, what the mood is on the streets? We've heard that the martial order is mainly in Bangkok, but as uh, you said, it's not a coup, it's, it's mainly to uh, keep, keep order. Thus, uh, do the people on the streets uh, feel that they're under martial law right now? For a part, yes. Uh, there are military in the streets. They occupy uh, some crossroads, uh, uh, and it takes care of a big gridlock in, uh, in Bangkok. And furthermore, there are 500 soldiers uh, stationed uh, uh, near the new airport Suvarnabhumi and 150 near the old airport Domhuang. So uh, nobody's got is no nobody knows what's going to happen, and uh, uh, both parties um, uh, want to demonstrate uh, Friday and the weekend, and that's against the martial law. So we have to wait how the military will react to that. Okay, Hans Boss there in Thailand, thank you uh, for joining us this morning. We're going to go quickly to a final story, of course, developing uh, now uh, in China with, of course, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, Russian, uh, Russian, uh, the Russian president did uh, come to China yesterday for a two-day visit. Moscow is hoping to sign a massive $400 billion gas agreement with Beijing, which might help counter the damage caused by the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia over the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, Oren, you're still uh, here with me. Of course, uh, when cynics will look at this, and especially Western cynics if we read the Western media and we'll say, of course, the Chinese and the Russians are, are now uh, staying, staying together because they realize that the, they are more beneficial together rather than apart. Yes, and it's not and it's not new, and it's not because of Ukraine. It goes um, uh, it goes back. It goes to the Arab Spring. It goes to Libya. It goes to Syria, and it goes to other interests. The funny part is that if you look uh, from at least a Western point of view to geopolitics, you see that Russia is bordering three worlds, so to speak: the Chinese, the Muslim, and the West. And if you look again at the threats, the threats to Russia should come from the South, from the Islam, and perhaps from China, more aggressive, more belligerent, more popular and uh, Siberia is empty and emptying, and the West could be a, an ally to Russia, but no, Moscow looks as the West as the great threat to Putin's regime, and perhaps uh, rightfully so, because of uh, democracy, etc., etc. So again, Ch Russia and China together, there are differences, there are differences of opinion, each one got its own interests, but again, they are hand in hand versus the West, and uh, this deal, not only because of uh, Ukraine, this deal could uh, be uh, for the long run. They see that Europe is, uh, is uh, less and less dependent on the Russian gas. They want more and more other sources. They go to greener uh, energy, etc. Mm -hmm. And China needs also to go greener, but greener from coal to gas is not like gas to whatever it is, wind, uh, sun, and, uh, and what have you. And China is growing in demand. But again, the Chinese know how to negotiate. Nobody will, will, will uh, overqualify them yeah. in that respect. So the deal is not there yet. And uh, we'll see how much, and it should be interesting to us to see how desperate is Russia to sign the deal. Gazprom is practically Kremlin uh, uh, owned. Yeah. So uh, to, to see whether they sign the deal in less beneficial terms than they intended to. But it's also interesting to look at it from a Western perspective because the unity between Russia and China, and you did mention that they're. Uh, perhaps uh, good friends from the Irish Spring and so forth. But if you look back to the Cold War, there was ideological differences uh, there and borders uh, disputes and so forth. 
So now it's, it's, we're it's taking two big... It's not going away. It's mm -hmm. not going away. That's the, of course, in the communist world, uh, Stalin uh, was in favor of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. He didn't want Mao Zedong. He didn't want a competitor as head of a huge uh, country. But uh, And then later, of course, there were the, the wars. And China does remember that uh, all uh, Russia, Eastern Russia, Vladivostok was once Chinese and was conquered in the Second Opium War. And they do remember the fighting on the Usuri River only 50 years ago. Right. So again, yes, there are differences, there are geopolitical, strategic differences. Russia doesn't want China to be more and more aggressive and belligerent on its own backyard. But, and there is suspicion, but there are also, uh, you know, there is also common ground. Right. We'll have to see. Well, the West uh, obviously loses its leverage uh, in negotiating uh, with both uh, big uh, giant Not powers now. Loses, no. but uh, still the uh, the West can less dictate, and perhaps that's a good thing. But it can less dictate either to Russia nor to China uh, anything. Or Nahari, thank you for joining thank me you. this morning. After the break, extreme parties from both the right and left side of the political map gain power after the first round of local elections in Greece. But first, let's hear some more of this morning's headlines. Good morning and thank you for staying with us. On to our next topic. In Greece, the first round of local elections ended with an increase in power for both the far right and the far left parties, putting additional strain on Prime Minister Antonis Samaras, who is already leading an unstable coalition. To discuss these resu results as well as their potential impact on the European Parliament election scheduled to take place next week, we're joined in studio by Avi Plumor, Israel's former ambassador to the EU. Good morning, Avi. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Also with us is Anthony Grant, who will review for us how the international media's take on these elections have been falling out. Anthony, thank you for Good joining morning. us. Uh, Ambassador Primor, of course, uh, the, the biggest question is, is, and people are analysts are probably looking back and asking themselves, is how these parties, both from the far right and the far, far left, and we'll uh, also speak specifically about the neo-Nazi parties, how they've risen in their popularity so fast. It's not a slow trend. Because they have only one thing in common, and that is protest protest votes. Things haven't gone well in Europe in the last five years. Things haven't gone well worldwide because of the uh, economic crisis. But some countries in Europe have been hit particularly hard. And there you see protest, protest against, against what goes wrong. So mm -hmm. where can they protest? When they have elections. Any elections, they could be national elections, they could be uh, uh, European elections, and that's how they come to express themselves. Now, the dissensions between them, even within the extreme right-wing parties, is enormous. It's not one block, because besides protesting, which is common to all of them, they have very different points of view on, on the real problems. But if you take the economic considerations which uh, you're, you're uh, pointing to and say, okay, there are economic uh, factors that do explain this rise in popularity, we're also talking about very uh, ideologically inclined parties. The Golden Dawn in Greece has a very neo-Nazi ideology. Is that also due to economic considerations, or can we also point to other factors, perhaps? No, no. They are a neo-Nazi party. It is, uh, I don't think there is an equivalent party in all of Europe with this particular one, maybe in Hungary. Right. But, uh, but even there, it doesn't come to the same expression as in uh, Greece. But um, they benefit from the economic crisis. That's not their reason. That's mm. not be, that's not why they're there. That's not why they 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 fight for something. But they benefit from so many votes who just want to protest. So people protest very often to the most extreme because that makes the most of noise. Yeah. They want to make noise. And they want to protest. But I don't think uh, ideologically they have gone very far. From your experience, uh, your vast experience, of course, in Europe <clears throat> and uh, in diplomacy. Sometimes uh, from here, from our place in Israel, we look towards these parties and the rise of these parties, and we, we raise a huge concern. Sometimes it feels as though Europe doesn't have that same concern. They don't look at those parties as, as something that is spoiling their political uh, climate or atmosphere. Oh, yes, they do. They do. They do. Oh, yes. There's great worry about the uh, right-wing parties. There's great worry all over Europe, uh, a bit less in Germany. 
First of all, because Germany has a certain past experience right. and people are afraid of the extreme right. Secondly, because Germany had a particular chance not, not to have a charismatic leader of the extreme right for some reason. Austria had one, uh, Holland has one, Belgium has one, France has one, and, and Italy has more than one, <laughs> and, and, uh, and Greece and Germany always had since um, the beginning of the new right-wing parties to emerge in the 60s, always very, very, let's say, gray people who led mm. those parties. But otherwise, you have it all over, and it's a great worry for all of the Europeans because it means instability in the European Parliament, and this instability will reflect on national parliaments. At least this is what they're afraid of. And there's only one cure to all that, and that is to cure the um, the economy and that means reform and reform means risk and pain something that not every country is willing to uh, take on that risk the ADL the anti-defamation league has uh, looked towards these election results with uh, great concern of course uh, citing that Greece is the most anti-semitic country in the world they just uh, released their uh, survey and report but they also are, are worried about and perhaps the impact that it does have on Jews across Europe, saying many are mulling now immigration due to the political climate on the ground in Europe. Do you... Well, I don't agree with that. Okay. First of all, to say that Greece is the most anti-Semitic country, every year you hear about another country which is the most anti-Semitic one. Oh, right. this, this is very... from Abe Foxman, oh, of course. I know, yeah. no, I know all those uh, <laughs> public opinion polls. I've even written a book about them. Uh, Listen, this is very populistic. I don't believe in that. Basically, I believe that anti-Semitism is not rising in Europe. On the contrary, anti-Semitism is receding constantly. Of course, you have the new anti-Semitism of the immigrants, of the Muslim immigrants. And uh, you have criticism against Israel, criticism against the Israeli-Palestinian policies, against the, the, the settlements and the territories and all that, which grow. But these are not necessarily motivated by anti-Semitism. Once right. this political problem disappears, the criticism will disappear with it. And we have seen such uh, uh, precedents in, uh, in history. We rem I remember the enormous protests against the Greek colonel regime. I remember the protests against France because of the war in Algeria. I remember the protests against the United States because of the war in, a war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. All this disappears when the cause of the protest disappears. Mm -hmm. Same thing will be with us when we solve the problem of the territories. But uh, basically, the European population after World War II does not take on an anti-Semitism. It recedes very slowly, very cautiously, but basically anti-Semitism recedes, and I think that goes for Greece too. Okay, Ambassador Primor, I want to hear now from Anthony Grant. International mm -hmm. media is looking uh, perhaps uh, towards Europe with, uh, as uh, Ambassador Primor said, they are mm -hmm. concerned. What does the headline say? Well, actually, you know, of course, I, I agree uh, spot on with, with uh, his assessment about the situation in Greece. And uh, um, some of the press reflects that, the sort of fascination with the Golden Dawn, this neo-fascist party, you know, mm -hmm. very reflective of the economic crisis, I think more so than anything else. And uh, you have some um, headlines which talk about how the, uh, the elections in the European Parliament are kind of like a litmus test for how things are going to go with the coalition. Will it bring about a period of more instability in Greece, which actually would not be good because actually economically, uh, press counters saying things are starting to kind of turn around for Greece. So actually it's a time when they need, and, and most of the Greek public actually is looking for more stability, even though there's a lot of coverage of these new political parties that are emerging. You know, there's one called Tupotami, the river, which is run by a former journalist. He has got no policies, but he's got 9% of the vote in polls. So it's a very fascinating time, and the press is kind of trying to catch up with what's happening in Greece. Ambassador Primor, what can the European Parliament do? Can it take any steps to uh, at least uh, uh, hinder the, the rise or the growth of these parties? Or, or can it just watch it from the, from the sidelines? It will be a problem for the uh, functioning of the European Parliament, undoubtedly. And that's uh, a source of worry because the European Parliament is becoming ever more important, getting ever more uh, power and intervening and more affairs, current affairs of the European uh, Union. When I was ambassador to the European Union, they used to laugh about Parliament in Brussels. Brussels, they said, okay, the Parliament, they can talk what they want, but we, the Commission, or we, the Council, we decide and uh, we implement. 
and and the parliament parliament can talk. This is not the case anymore. Parliament has a lot to say, and both the council and the commission are very much afraid of the, of the parliament. So it's essential that parliament uh, can function normally. And uh, the right wing, if they become very powerful, and what is predicted is about 25 percent, will be a real problem, will be a, a handicap. But the parliament will enjoy one thing, and that is that the right wing parties are not coherent, that they have a lot of dissensions among themselves. Right. That's why they'll probably, they'll probably be weaker than their numbers will suggest. And this is the big. So hope. they're still on the fringe, and they haven't, of course, a form. They'll be on the fringe meeting. because they won't work together. Okay, Ambassador Avi uh, Primor, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. We're going to have here headlines uh, very soon, so you can stay in studio. And we say hello again to Anthony Grant, who joins us daily to discuss the news you may have missed while scanning this morning's headlines. Anthony. Well, good morning again. Good morning again. Um, here's a headline from the Jerusalem Post that made a bit of an international splash. Um, and it's kind of a, not, not such a dramatic looking photo there, but you have Israeli defense official uh, Amos Gilad, right. who is the uh, head of political military affairs at Israel, Israel's defense ministry, who says that Iran can break out to nuclear weapons very quickly. I mean, this is not sort of an, an earth-shattering headline, but because but of the context, it's the timing, right, and, the the timing and also and the, the language in the article, uh, it's it's quite strong. You know, he's he's saying in uh, no uncertain terms that uh, no one is or uh, Israel hasn't been able to uh, to deter uh, or to prevent Hezbollah's arsenal building up, thanks, of course, to Iran uh, in no small part. And he talks about how the July 20th deadline for nuclear talks, if it's delayed, it would be actually great for the Iranians because they want to stop the momentum of sanctions. And this is, it's a very, um, I don't know what the word is, but very cut, cut strong language. Yeah. It's kind of like he wants people to pay attention and, and people in the media are when someone of that stature of talks course. like and that. And he of course is doing this, as you said, the July 20th deadline is around the corner yeah. and I think Israel is pretty worried that any kind of deal will be struck that will leave Israel without any options or <clears throat> yeah. military options uh, to uh, combat Iranian uh, and nuclear. And uh, a thing like Catherine Ashton, you know, uh, leaving the EU position that she's in in October, and it, it, so it's going to be up to Obama administration very much so that you know to really be um, um, to be pro proactive on that. So I think it's also a little bit of a messaging in that uh, Indeed. story. Indeed. Um, moving on to some also interesting question of timing in the South China Morning Post. Um, this is um, we have a, just a picture from uh, their headlines yesterday, or late yesterday, China trade with Russia to hit U.S. 100 billion. I think actually I was told it's four, 400 billion. It might have been a typo on their part. Um, the president of China says after meeting Putin. So that's quite interesting to see, especially considering the, the, the friction now between the U.S. and China. So right. China's and got... the U.S. and Russia, of and course. China has other friends besides the U.S. Look at that. Well, China needs to look for new friends besides the U.S. And so does, yeah. so does Russia. I mean, we're, so they're in the same uh, boat pretty Right much. there. And also, there was a little headline there, well, quite interesting, saying that the, the CIA mm -hmm. may be withholding information about Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, according to a former Malaysian prime minister. What kind of information? Well, I don't know because they are yeah. apparently, <laughs> you know, it's wow. quite intriguing. This is a very serious newspaper. Uh, so again, I think we're going to be seeing more uh, about that aspect of that mystery huh. flight. Well, um, I mean, we want to. So far, we're only seeing like now conspiracy books coming out and yeah, so forth. We don't. Yeah. The facts have been long, uh, long uh, neglected almost. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so we'll see. But interesting to see it though on the front page. Indeed. Um, Going on to uh, Bloomberg, talking about the impact of the martial law situation in Thailand. Uh, it's not actually a shocking headline. Th Thai martial law is seen as hurting Bangkok and Phuket tourist arrivals. Well, no big surprise there, yeah. but tourism is so important in this country. Um, they've already taken yeah. a hit, and this is going to make things exacerbate that situation. You know, it's it's interesting because uh, I know a few people that went to Thailand over the few uh, past few months when their fighting was... Uh, on the streets of Bangkok, and mm. once you go out, you know, to the islands, you feel like you're in a different world, and you don't feel the fighting and it's the dissonance between right. the city of Bangkok and, and of course, uh, the the serene uh, yeah. tourist attractions of Thailand. And are, of course, it's huge. it's largely calm from press reports, but you know, you hear the word the words martial law, and it makes travelers skittish. You know, you know, they might choose other destinations, and right. that, that those decisions translate into less, um, less currency. Yeah, you know, less so, investments coming in. Yeah, and speaking of travel as well, we have a headline from Globu. Uh, big Brazilian newspaper uh, about Sao Paulo, 40% of the districts of this huge Brazilian city have homicide rates which are spiking to above 10 per 100,000 residents. Wow. Now, 
This is coming, you know, ahead of the World Cup, uh, some of those games which will be played in, in Sao Paulo. And again, they're having a lot of problems ahead of these games, uh, crime, um, environmental issues. So this is just add this to the mix. Oh, and well, yeah, that's something going to be hard to get those statistics down before the World Cup. It's right around the corner. Yeah, I mean, actually, in Rio de Janeiro, they're printing out brochures of, like, what to do when you're mugged. Not, like, if, but when. When. <laughs> you know, don't make loud noises, et cetera, et cetera. So they're trying to kind of don't resist. alert people. <laughs> to uh, the problems they might encounter oh, down there. That's so, a sticky situation. Yeah. Also in Cairo, Al-Aram reports that uh, Egyptian universities are going to be closed from the 22nd to the 31st of May because of the uh, election and uh, apparently attempts to avoid the kind of situations that have been happening in the past couple of days with confrontations. A uh, student uh, was reported to be uh, shot on Tuesday and killed at the University of Cairo in a scuffle. Uh, so, again, tensions building in Egypt ahead of the election so, coming up soon. And, and the Egyptian authorities decided, <clears throat> instead of uh, trying to tackle uh, the protesters, let's just close down the university. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, Bassem Youssef, the, the, the talk show host, yeah. is very pop, you know, he's just off the air, yeah. you know, for the month of elections. To It's a very um, preemptive, we could say, approach to... Preemptive is, is a nice is diplomatic a word. Diplomatic to word. So, and anyway. very quickly... Uh, Libération, a French newspaper, reports that things are looking up in Iraq. That's basically what that had line says. Mm -hmm. They interview a professor in uh, Baghdad who says that uh, Nouri al-Maliki, who was recently re-elected, has actually helped to prevent civil war from, you know, becoming uh, an engulfing problem there. So it's kind of a uh, an upbeat piece about Iraq, of all places. Yeah. For now. For now. For yeah. now. Anthony Grant, you'll be back with some more headlines right. from the web. See you. See you soon. And coming up next, it's prime time for the Mean Girls on American television. I know you love those Mean Girls. But first, let's hear some more of this morning's headlines. Welcome back. It's still Wednesday, May 21st, 2014. This is still the morning edition. And I, of course, am still your Elvis Nerlevy. Thank you for staying with us. So we have Selena Meyer on Veep, Claire Underwood on House of Cards, and Olivia Pope on Scandal. Television's prime time is now full of powerful women who also have quite the mean streak in them. For more on these gorgeous villainesses, we're joined in studio by Wine in America's journalist, Ronnie Stav. Ronnie, thanks for being with us. Thank you. So, you know, it is, it's interesting how the trends in television have uh, really yeah. taken over American prime time, and it right. is about powerful women. Well, you know, I do think that it's more about just um, powerful jobs. Um, we see uh, all throughout uh, different TV series the whole idea of uh, Washington and all the scams that are going through around the um, the government, the regime, however you would like to call that. Um, and we do see a lot of uh, powerful roles, and the women are much more powerful than they used to be. Um, a woman is uh, today a role by itself. It's not uh, standing up for her men or not standing up for her men, but she's by herself. Um, and in this um, article, um, at the Times by Alessandra Stanley. She is talking about the fact that women today are um, more powerful, that maybe there's not um, any equality in between men and women um, in other genres, but there is uh, the equality um, in the idea of mean people or bad right. uh, people, the villains of TV series. But, but also if you take it to real life, I mean, uh, if we look at the shows like Veep and Claire Underwood uh, in House of Cards and even Olivia Pope in Scandal, these are all very, very strong women who have, you know, a real big say in Washington. Mm -hmm. If you look at Washington today, it's all ruled and, and continue to be power, powered by men. Not really a lot of women. That's true, and and that's another thing that she is talking about um, in her article. That it's something that is still not uh, seen in reality, but they're starting to create um, such a reality in those um, TV series, um, trying to um, intertwine that idea of a powerful woman. To me, I do well. You said it the right way. You said strong women, and I think this is um, this is one place where this article. Um, 
is a little still, I think she's uh, trying to create this equality and uh, this feminist um, idea, but I do think it's create kind of the other way around because mm -hmm. just like you're saying, these are strong women, not bad women, right. you know, and, and all these roles, you mentioned Olivia, Olivia Pope from Scandal. If you um, try and um, compare that to Don Draper, let's say, um, two powerful people standing in a powerful position, a little confused about what's going on in their personal life and their romantic lives, Don Draper is not being uh, considered as a mean person right. or a bad person. He's just confused. Olivia Pope, that is doing the same thing, is a bad woman. Meaning, in order for Hollywood or in order for us uh, watching these uh, programs to accept uh, these women as being strong, perhaps they do need to be mean. Exactly. They're no nice, strong e women. Exactly. It used to be the idea that um, s what defined a woman um, in the sense of if she's bad or not was the way she regards her men. If she's good to her men, she's good. If she's bad to her men, she's bad. So today it's about herself. Today she can do for herself and by that uh, being considered bad or good. But if you take the same man and, uh, and see that he's doing the same kind of actions for himself, trying to keep himself um, going up the scale of roles, of jobs, of power, or of, of, of money, whatever that is, you won't consider him to, mm -hmm. be, to be mean or bad. If you're taking uh, The Good Wife, and she is, um, she is mentioning The Good Wife, um, showing that Alicia Florrick right. is the other type of woman she's good she's staying good she's staying for her men but if you look at the women around the good wife if you look at Kalinda Sharma the investigator right. she's um, her borders are a little um, blurry blurry exactly <laughs> I was trying to find a word that <laughs> would work with that um, and because of that she is considered dangerous right. she's considered a woman that you don't know how she's gonna react and that you should take her uh, very much under consideration that you don't know if she's gonna be good for you or bad for you right. if you take but a she man is very powerful she is very right. powerful but if you take a man that is doing the same role and if you take her equivalent that is joining um, I think in season two mm -hmm. he's not considered bad until very much later Kalinda is being considered someone that you don't want to mess with right so I think that the whole idea even if you um, try and uh, look at the way that uh, people will react to these women they'll say she has balls she's uh, she's manning up you know right. and these are all um, characteristics that are talking about men and if you talk I and mean, if you take it to a little bit more of um, current uh, news if you take uh, Jill Emerson uh, right. former um, head of New York Times, head of yeah. New York Times um, um, that it's all speculations because she haven't interviewed and the Times didn't um, release anything about what has happened but the rumor said that um, she came uh, to to talk about the fact that she is not receiving the same amount as her former in the duty that it was men. And mm -hmm. what happened at the end of this uh, conversation is that she got fired. Now you see that the minute that she got fired, no one is talking about, oh, poor Jill. Everyone's talking about, oh, she was a bitch. Right. So this whole idea of strong with a woman became something that is completely vague. And I think that this is a very toxic kind of an idea. Right. That, that a strong- you have to be strong. And, and the most, all of what we've been speaking about mostly are the strong women they're politicians in their blood you don't see many uh, different kinds of characters uh, that are uh, strong and villainous that aren't have that political streak in them and the only uh, good example that I can think of maybe uh, correct me if I'm wrong is girls which is a, uh, it's a show just about women exactly. and none of them are none of them have that political streak they're all very uh, on different kinds of fields None and, of them are really mean. Uh, well, you know, they are talking about the fact that they're all very mean and very narcissistic. Lena narcissistic, Dunham, yeah. <laughs> Lena Dunham actually said, um, they asked her, they said, none of your characters are likable. And she said, well, I don't like my friends, I love my friends. So this whole show is about the fact that they're very much mean to each other. But even if you take that idea, so it's the same thing, because when one of them is saying something completely mean or cruel to one another, they're all like opening their wide eyes and saying, what is going on with you and when the men in the series are doing the same things right. things that are as narcissistic as um self-observed uh, they're they're just being you know no one is taking that um up to consideration about what is the mean of their real character right so and if i go along with uh, your theory which i accept uh, completely is, is that <laughs> 
I was like, yes, Barbara, the women, yeah, yes. No. Is that the, these women, in order to become powerful, they have to be mean, and they're not held up to the same standards as their male counterparts. Well, Meaning I actually don't even say that they're mean. They're just powerful. And the public today... Um, it By calling is, them mean girls, perhaps we're misjudging them. Exactly. The public today can see a woman that is powerful, but still don't hold her to the same standards as they would hold any other woman. They're another type of woman. They're powerful, they're strong, and therefore they're, um, you know, uh, bitches or yeah. uh, only mean. Villainous. Villainous. villainous, villainous. Do, you have a favorite? You Do you have a favorite that you personally uh, find? Of, a... of the villainous? Oh. I don't think they're villain. I think they're all fantastic. <laughs> all right, so you have a fa who's your favorite? <laughs> Well, who's my favorite? Um, you know, so many of them. I think Claire Underwood and Olivia Pope would probably be. <laughs> yeah, Olivia gets annoying though at the end. But yeah. well, well, you know, this whole Claire show is, is a complete soap, <laughs> and, and I'm just like, wow, Shonda yeah. Rhimes, where did you come up with but that? Claire Underwood, so. my God, I would not want to meet her in an alleyway. Oh, she yeah. scares me. Yeah, yeah. Wanna <laughs> <laughs> stab? Thank you for joining us. Stay with us. Thank you. Because we get to say now hello and good morning once again to our one and only Anthony Grant, who's here with What's Hot on the Web. Mm, Before we start well, anything, well, who's your favorite? Well, I want to. Before I can speak to that, I want to, you know, there seems to be like this battle between the sexes here, you know, men, women, and, but you who, feel, you're feeling I feel it, feel you're it feeling but, yeah, but what, what can unite men and women besides yeah. the obvious thing? Uh, we have music. Justin Bieber? No, what? we have music. <laughs> we have music, music, and Miley Cyrus. Oh, there is. Who? Oh. Who? It wasn't far the off. The equivalent. Yes. Yeah. The internet is still abuzz with her covering of um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, ah. John Lennon's uh, Beatles, 1967 she hit. She did it, she, she did, did a good seriously? job. Can we take a quick listen yes, from the let's Billboard listen. Awards? We have to listen. You know, right. out of respect to John, she covered herself up this time. Yeah, she covered herself up. It was, you know, it was a great. She was with the there with the flaming lips there in Manchester, and you know, I think you know she's 20, and it's amazing that she's taken this on because to cover a Beatles song, you know, in in that fashion, it does you know, it takes balls, I think, and I think she did a great job. Good, I'm happy. Well, she's yeah. trying to perhaps uh, tweak twerk her image. Yeah, to up twerk it or up something. It. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of image, remember um, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West on the cover of Vogue? I do. Well, they've set off a trend. Now we have Spanish Vogue with that on the cover. Oh. Now we've got their uh, Real Madrid soccer player, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, wow. and his I Russian mean, we model wife. a little wife. bit too much of Ronaldo, no? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, don't. Uh, I mean, uh, we you see know, more it's, of Ronaldo than we saw of Kanye. Well, you know, he's trying to one up Kanye, which oh, is not an easy it. thing to do. So it's going to be a competition now. But I think it's tasteful. Yes, oh, I think no. it's tastefully <laughs> done. You know. Is Seth Rogen and James Franco found their way into that <laughs> yeah, cover as well? I don't know if they speak Spanish, but uh, anyway, that's uh, fun stuff. <laughs> oh, by the way, stuff. do we have updates about where Kim Kardashian is getting married? We have or an update. Which now this we is. We want to send our team out is, there to cover it. Okay, so. listen. The the rumors are flying, but we have news that come this Friday. They're going to be offering their guests a surprise, well, so much for the surprise, yeah. private visit of the Palace of Versailles. Oh. You know, for their, they're not going to get married there. Now, I have, I have to say here. Kim is so highbrow, huh? It's a little, it's <laughs> highbrow, but it's a little problematic because wasn't the whole thing about Versailles historically that people were sort of kept out and then they kind of had a revolution? Yes, so something I, like that. So I think Americans are going to be a little bit taken this the wrong way. I mean, I'm Versailles that private. Kim knows where Versailles is. Oh, I mean, listen, I'm sure her geographic knowledge knows no bounds, but, you know, no bounds. but I mean, you know, they, clearly the pair love Paris and that's great, but I think they should open up their wedding to but everyone, showing you know, and, Versailles to as like, this is going to be my future home or, well, you know, they're going to get a lot of decor and design ideas. I think they already have like a gold plated toilet in their Beverly Hills mansion or no something way. like that, something of that effect. No and way. Versailles is all about the gold. Yes. Yeah. Well, she and Sarah Netanyahu can have a whole discussion Ooh, about I can't Versailles. Speak to that, but, <laughs> but I know they both like home decor. They, candles, they're both very candles. Uh, vanilla patchouli. Very candles. appreciative of. <laughs> I don't think Versailles had vanilla patchouli, but I know that Marie Antoinette was a favorite. Uh, she liked um, what's that? Um, Violet. 
It was a very uh, nice fragrance. Well, uh, yeah. Sharon Netanyahu likes her patchouli. Well, I think Kim Kardashian is having a Marie Antoinette moment personally, but yes. we'll see what happens as the we nuptials will. approach. We will. Mm. We'll on a, on a more, more inspirational note, our own i24news.tv uh, ran a story about Israeli blind golfer, war veteran Zohar Sharon, 61 years old, who won his fifth World Blind Golf Championship wow. this past weekend in Australia. Amazing story. I actually have the pleasure of having met Zohar wow. when he was a playing golf out in Palm Springs, California really? a couple of years ago. And the article doesn't mention, but very instrumental to his, not necessarily the golfing, but his life is the um, guide dogs. They come from the Israel Guide Dog Center for mm -hmm. the Blind, and they're beautiful golden retrievers, and it's just a nice story to see that he's out there and you know, making the Indeed. athletics Indeed. work for him. Indeed. That's a good, it's something that many Israelis should know about and probably not many uh, Probably do, not many do, but, but more so. Yeah, and it's very impressive. And he uh, he practices often at um, in Caesarea, yeah. which yeah. is up the, the coast. The only golf course that Israel has. But it's a beautiful golf course. It is beautiful. And I think that's where uh, Netanyahu has his private home. He does. He does. Yeah, yeah. A lot of yeah. upscale properties. I see properties. you're brushing up on your Netanyahu yes. knowledge. Yes, well, you know, it, it all comes down to real <laughs> estate, <laughs> doesn't down. it? You know, in, in all sorts of ways. Nice. I'm impressed. Mm, what well, else? Gracias. Yes, and uh, mon dieu, mon dieu, which is French for oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. Cannes, and we have to go back to Cannes Film Festival, and this movie has caused a bit of a stir with Gerard Depardieu. Uh -huh. It's called Welcome to New York. Okay. And you know, this is sort of um, loosely based on the scandal with Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the former French presidential mm. frontrunner, and his which run. Nobody really knows what happened there. No one really knows, but if you look at those pictures of Gerard Depardieu just, yeah. in, in a towel yeah. and a maid, um, you know, it, you, you could say that he's getting a little bit close to the the alleged, well, the wow. scandal that did erupt. And French people in the elite positions of power wanted him not to go near this film. They had a problem getting I mean, funding. They had it premiered in France. Just, it's, yeah. I mean, this is a brand new scandal. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's for... very fresh. Um, we're not really sure of all the legal details involved no. with that. Apparently, the film was quite good. They um, screened it at a former uh, sort of soft porn theater in Cannes. Really? So, yeah. So someone, they were kind of trying to make a so someone, bit of a statement. Someone didn't lose their sense of humor, right. in, in Cannes. So I don't know if nice. it's going to win the Palme d'Or, but interesting to see. Um, really interesting, and I want to see that film. On a more subdued note, uh, we talked about Kardashians getting married, but George Clooney and Amal Alamuddin have set the date for their nuptials. Why is that subdued? That sounds well, like a because they're not, they're not as showy as, as the Karda as uh, Kanye West. They're right. more, uh, September 12th appears to be the date that they have set. This is a good day. reported in the in the Leban Lebanese paper, the Daily Star. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to get married? I know I don't know where they're going to get married, but I think they're going to um, uh, maybe a little Italian village near where uh, George Clooney has a villa in Lake right. Como. Because uh, we have invited them over here for their honeymoon if they're going to get married in Lebanon. We did. We that's did right. Call, call no, out to them and say. Just jump over to the Jaffa port. They may he... have to go via Amman, Jordan, because of various logistical issues. Come uh, on, but just but we get want over them here. here all the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll host them. Party at the port. Party at the port, George. <laughs> yeah. What else? Ah, Mick Jagger is now the world's coolest uh, great grandpa. Is he? Wow. Yeah. And yeah. He's the world's coolest. You could, I, have, you could I, have kept it there. I. He's the world's coolest. He's 70, and he's a great grandpa for the first time because his 21-year-old granddaughter, Assisi. Oh, that will that will do it for you. Had a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, when you're nice. Uh, well, uh, Mazal Tov to Mick Mazel Jagger. Mazal Tov to Mick Jagger. Uh, yes. The coolest great grandfather. Mazal Tov to you, Anthony Grant, for just Back coming here and waking you. up this morning. <laughs> That's a big. Uh, a big feat, and thank you, Ronnie Stav, for coming <laughs> also you. this morning. Coming up next after the break, it's been 80 years since the deaths of outlaw lovers Bonnie and Clyde. We're going to find out more, but first, let's hear some more of this morning's headlines. Good morning, and thank you for staying with us. We're joined now in studio by the I-24 News correspondent, Gabby Tatarovsky. Hi, Gabby. Hi. So, what are we starting with? We're going to start with the first black U.S. president. It's Bill Clinton. And you know, that's... Black? Yeah, 
Okay. Yes, that, what do you mean? That, that's, that's the common joke that people often said about Clinton. Then he was so cool, he was actually the first black president. <laughs> and, one, and one of his attributes was his love for jazz. And now right. finally is being acknowledged by the Thelonious Monk Institute for Jazz. It's the most prestigious honor the Institute is going to, to give uh, Bill Clinton. He's been an advocate uh, for jazz for many years. He played the sax yeah, in we, his we inauguration yeah. on the Arsenio Hall show. And even during his first term, he, he did a small club gig in uh, Prague, which was very successful. And um, this is going to be an all-star tribute concert in November in Los Angeles with Herbie Hancock and, wow. Wayne, and Wayne Shorter and a lot of the great jazz giants who live today. And most likely, Bill is going to play the sax once again. So, I mean, I, I, the question is always with Bill Clinton is uh, we've always seen him play the sax, and it gives him this kind of, as you say, this cool kind of edge to him. My question is, is he really good at jazz, or is it one of those things that, oh, he knows how to play uh, saxophone, so, and he's president, so, it, you know, it looks, it's, go, it's good for the image, perhaps, better for mu it's than music. A, it's a great publicity stunt, but he ha he's actually a very good musician. I mean, he, he could... Is. At, he at, gets at, it. Yes. At one time, he actually considered to follow his dreams and become a professional jazz musician, but he was not as uh, confident as others uh, might have uh, wanted him to be, and he decided to go... Uh, for the uh, presidency. For instead. the presidency and to be a politician. And uh, one of the great uh, jazz players um, played with, uh, I think it was the King of Thailand, who's also a, right. a sax player. And after he jammed with him, he said to everyone, well, you know, he's no Bill Clinton. <laughs> so Bill Clinton get, gets, uh, gets a... He has a good rep. A good rep, absolutely. That, that's, uh, well, funny. Uh, Hillary plays anything? No, right? We don't know um, anything. I have something uh, malicious to say, but no, no she so doesn't. No, so you're not going to no. say it because you know I'm, not, I'm, not I'm gonna a huge say, Hillary no. fan. Yeah, 2016, <laughs> we, can 2016. Hardly, we can hardly wait. Exactly. Exactly. She'll, don't worry, she'll be a violinist or something, you know, <laughs> something very uh, intelligent. I, I want to see Hillary on the drums. Yeah. <laughs> Hillary bangs a drum. And Chelsea on, on the like, <laughs> flute on, behind. Oh, she's, behind. Oh, she, she, she's such a flute camp girl. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One time in bad camp. Yeah. Uh, Led Zeppelin, definitely not a one time in bad camp. Kind no. Of, what's going no. on there? Um, well, there's going to be a little rain on the Led Zeppelin parade. There's going to be a massive reissue campaign launching uh, over the next month with Jimmy Page, the notable guitarist, uh, personally in charge of the remastering. And now, all of a sudden, a lawsuit regarding a little song. I don't know if you heard <laughs> about it. It's called Stairway to Heaven. I think it has potential. It does, doesn't and it? I mean, it, but it's, it's been so so many years since. It's, it's been, been like it's been so years. many years. It was originally released in 1971 on Led Zeppelin's fourth album, and now an attorney representing a group called Spirit claims that Led Zeppelin ripped off Spirit, uh, an instrumental track called Taurus. I heard the track. It's not remotely similar. Really? O only just a little bit the intro, but it sounds like the man is uh, tuning his guitar. It could sound like <laughs> the intro of Stairway to Heaven. It could be a dozen other things. And he said that there is a chance that Led Zeppelin were aware of this track because they toured together in the late 60s. I'm not sure Jimmy Page or Robert Plant even remember the band spirit or the fact that they toured. It's a, it's uh, a very don't know odd. The band spirit. But Absolutely. Why did it take them so so many years? I mean, almost like half a century to yeah, come up with this lawsuit. It's, it's very very peculiar, and the and the composer of the spirit track is already dead. So the lawyer is really. Who's he fighting for then? He's fighting for his estate. Ah, he's, okay. he's trying to cash in on the stairway to heaven royalties, which I assume are Pretty humongous. <laughs> yes, uh, stairway to the bank, I believe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's what's happening here. Obviously, so in terms of a uh, legal uh, ground, does it have any? I don't think so. Besides it, the intro, as you said? I don't think so. It's, it's a very shade, shady lawsuit. It might damage the reissue campaign, but I think that it doesn't have a doesn't have a chance. I mean, but even if uh, they decide to settle, I mean, I'm sure the the money that goes into the settlement is 
I, big enough I believe, for the... I believe Jimmy Page will not give one penny really? to any okay. of the Spirit Band members. And he's been in a bad mood because Robert, <laughs> Robert Plant has been uh, avoiding any further reunion plans for Led Zeppelin. And Jimmy Page was very uh, enthusiastic that the remastering campaign of the classic albums will, re will lead to further reunion shows, but uh, Robert Plant doesn't want any. And you don't want to get Jimmy Page in a bad mood? That's definitely not something no. smart. Uh, all right, Jam and the Holograms. Yes, now we're talking about real music. Forget real music. Led Zeppelin. Jam and the Holograms. It was a very popular, it was a very popular TV show in the 80s, uh, based on a popular toy line by Hasbro, and they're going to do a live action film. Nice. And look at those people and Juliet Lewis. Uh, Juliet, Lu Juliet Lewis and Molly Ringwald are cast. We don't know their exact roles yet, but this is going to be a very fun film because the original series, which was really catered for the MTV generation, spawned nearly 200 original songs. And there's this whole... 200? I have no idea. Al almost 200 in three seasons. And so there's got a, they've got a lot to choose from. And Juliet Lewis is also a musician with her band, Juliet and the Licks. Right. And Molly Ringwald is just uh, Molly always, a always a pleasure to watch oh, always her. Always a pleasure to watch. And so when is this coming out? I believe it will be out next year. But we don't know. Now we just know like the rumors. We don't know the, who's playing. We, we who. know. We know the rumors. We know that uh, initial shooting has begun. Okay. Production has been uh, already taken off. But I think we're going to see more and more from Gem and the Holograms. It would be interesting to see. Indeed. And last but not least. Morrissey. Nice. Yes, a notorious uh, vegetarian, and he's a notorious uh, vegetarian. Yes. Uh, well, they all are notorious. Na now they are. And they're all notorious. I don't think they're all vegetarians. <laughs> and now he, he teamed up with uh, the Peter organization, and this uh, clip is actually going to be Morrissey's new opening act. The video, which condemns uh, farmed caged kitchen, uh, chickens, right. is going to be screened at every show of Morrissey. So it's like their video art uh, during the show. During the show with uh, a Morrissey soundtrack, with one of his songs, hope, hoping to get awareness to the cruel uh, state uh, of mean, chickens. Seeing it, we're seeing it now in split screen. It definitely does uh, bring it's awareness. It's, it's, it's cruel, a... but Morrissey's lyrics, and Yasmin can back me up on this, are much cru crueler <laughs> than the reality of any farmed animals. I mean, <laughs> the guy knows cruelty. <laughs> uh, and and the, the the name of his upcoming album is uh, goes does coincide with uh, this video art. World peace is none of your business. Yes. He's taking a pretty political stance here. Not he, he never was that political. It's, it's interesting how all these uh, artists now are going on the vegan trends, on the animal trends. It's Mo like Morrissey was first. The Smiths had an album called Meat Is Murder back right. in 1985. Oh, 83. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Morrissey always drops in a few lines of cynicism and political angst. Uh, one of his lyrics said, uh, love, peace, and happiness uh, may be in the next world. He's, he's not very an optimistic person, and he knows uh, the true tragedy. When the uh, PETA spokesman, uh, spokeswoman said the best way for anyone to celebrate Morrissey's birthday is to go vegan, not someday, but today. So everyone yeah. wins from this little collaboration of uh, yes. video art. I'm except eat except for the bussy. chickens. Except for the chickens, of course. Any ch you're not vegan, though. No, no. And this won't convince not. you. No. So won't. So sorry, Maz. Sorry, Maz. <laughs> no bye. <laughs> no bye. Not even your chickens can uh, convince me. No. Uh, Gabby, stay on because we're going to take a look back and see what happened on this week dozens and hundreds of years ago. We, of course, are joined by I24 News correspondent Yasmin K. Hi, Yasmin. Hello. How are you? You're not vegan either. Are you? I'm not. No, I was actually just saying I'm going to have a bacon body in honor oh. of Morrissey. Oh. Yeah, I think for every animal he doesn't eat, I'm gonna eat two. I'm gonna up the meat intake. Oh wow! Oh wow! And and when yeah. you start touring, you know you can do different video art and make sure to contra uh, <laughs> the chickens and, and well, so I forth. Well, I only eat free range, which makes it better somehow. That's a British. It's still uh, murder. It's still thing, murder. <laughs> but it's tasty murder. Free range, yeah. Um, that's that's. A, we won't go into acceptable. that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good PR stunt, free definitely, range. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, yes, so, um, as you said, this week in history, uh, first item I want to talk about is the famous death of Bonnie and Clyde, one of the, the most infamous famous... Death, maybe. Yeah, infamous <laughs> death, thank you. Uh, one of the most famous crime duos um, of all time, I think. Uh, so they died in a bloody shootout in 1934. Um, this was over a few years of them basically collaborating on a life of crime, uh, 
over five states. Wow. Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, New Mexico, Louisiana. They killed around 13 people. I mean, what we forget, despite the kind of glamour that, of exactly uh, the kind it. of gangsters like, nope. mold, the photos that made them very, very famous, you know, Bonnie posing with a cigar in her mouth, all of this kind of stuff, they actually killed 13 people, including because, I mean, nine. You, you say um, Bonnie and Clyde to someone today, and, and they think of, you know, the glamour. They forget mm. that they were actual people in the 30s. As yeah. you said, a woman in the 30s uh, running around uh, the south of the United States and killing people mm. was not something uh, you saw every day. No, and not they were at criminals. All. They were criminals. They were criminals, <laughs> but they actually harbored <laughs> dreams. Um, I mean, Bonnie, I guess, would have been happy to have been immortalized in the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde with right. Faye Dunaway playing her. She wanted to be a movie star. In fact, uh, when the police actually recovered some of the cars used in their robberies, she'd left her movie magazines. Well, in the there backseat. you go. Yeah, and, and uh, you know Clyde else, uh, wanted to be a musician. He did. He did. Yeah. Well, yeah, she they, asked they for his do guitar they back. Want. They're like, you know, they're they're living celebrities even today, and and I guess what uh, tests that most is, of course, uh, Jay Z and Beyonce's song Bonnie and Clyde. Mm. You know that song. I'm going to nod and go, okay. mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> making, yeah. Make, my, my point is, of course, is that criminals uh, such as Bonnie and Clyde have become uh, cool and people forget that they're actually yeah. real criminals. No, completely. Completely. Moving on. <laughs> okay, so moving on a uh, little bit further back in history, back in 1873, uh, Levi Strauss, way back. way back, and Jacob Davis received the patent for the first blue jeans. And became millionaires. Yeah, I mean, this was a great collaboration between a uh, kind of relatively well-known San Francisco businessman, Levi, uh, Levi Strauss, who was right. approached by Davis, who was a tailor who'd actually developed, um, you know, a new way to make uh, jeans stronger by introducing the now famous metal rivets on the stress points but he couldn't actually have um, he didn't actually have enough money to finance the whole process right so he approached uh, Strauss and together they developed what became uh, known as the Levi uh, 501s, 501. which are now worth, I think, an original uh, pair are worth nearly two hundred thousand really? dollars. Yeah, from Who I mean, knew? obviously from 1873. This is huge rags to riches story. I remember, you know, when you study uh, American history, mm. uh, one of the biggest anecdotes of, of the, the California Gold Rush and so forth, and Oregon Trail, which is a ancient computer game, which I won't go into. Mm. Uh, is all, that. You remember that? I do. It's all about the, the sturdy genes that the miners could use to go down and mine. And that's how it started. Mm. It was complete, you know, uh, yeah, completely. technical, logistic kind of uh, wear and became fashionable, of course. Yeah, and obviously became something completely linked right. to America. I and mean, Levi just thinking of the album an covers with genes. An immigrant to California and, and became, of course, uh, Super rich. And yeah, and a philanthropist as well. He oh, was yeah. actually really well known as a, um, a philanthropist. He established uh, scholarships at the University of California, um, and he was really well known, well liked, and well respected in the city. So nice. that's nice. What else? Yes. Um, okay, this is a, a much sadder tale. This is Oscar Wilde's uh, trial and imprisonment for indecency in May on May the twenty fifth, eighteen ninety five. Uh, now, uh, Stephen Fry, who we see here, uh, <laughs> portraying Oscar Wilde in Wilde. Yeah. Um, as you know, I think he actually made a documentary about this recently. It's a really, really tragic tale. Uh, it started with Wilde actually suing the father of his uh, male lover for libel. During the trial, uh, the father retaliated by uh, accusing Wilde of uh, indecency, uh, sodomy and homosexual acts. In the end, he was actually convicted and sentenced to two years hard labor right. in Reading Jail. Um, and upon his release, I mean, it was basically the decline of, of Oscar Wilde. He immediately left the country uh, in disgrace. He was destitute. You know, he died right. in a Paris hotel, uh, you know, very, very, very uh, impoverished. Um, he'd lost nearly everything. I mean, he didn't even have the strength to write towards the end, but he was still witty. He actually quipped one of the last times somebody uh, saw him out of his hotel as he was becoming increasingly ill, was uh, my wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death. One of us will have <laughs> to go. So he, he remained very witty until the end, but, you know, and, and absolute course, tragedy like look, that he was prosecuted and convicted indeed. for this. And, and you look at back, you know, uh, 1895, so long ago, so, so long ago, yet, yet not that long ago, and you see his uh, the, the importance of being earned and Dorian Gray and mm. all uh, brilliant work, but it's one of those uh, things that it was brilliant only after, of course, he died and the, mo the world mm. moved on and, and grew up. Exactly. I don't think he had any inkling of how um, important right. he would he would be after his death. Right, like many other artists, and unfortunately. Mm. 1977, Star 1977, Wars. 1977, Star Wars, yes. So this is the release that makes of... That um, old, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't yet alive Neither was when I, this came still, out. I feel like actually. it's part of our generation. It's true. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we all know, obviously, 
the story of Star Wars, not going to go into it, but uh, just want to talk a little bit about how it conquered the box office. Mm -hmm. Actually received seven Oscars, earned 461 million in US ticket sales and 800 million world worldwide. Wow. Um, I don't want to talk about the new Star Wars films. Yeah. There, are, you know. Are you, are you a fan of the old Star Wars? Yes, but I've been in pain since 1999 when um, <laughs> you, when the really Phantom Menace was released. <laughs> so instead, I wanted to give you a few quick Star Wars facts. Jabba the Hutt was originally intended to be furry. I only found this out recently. Furry Jabba the Hutt. Wow. Yoda has a different number of toes in each Star Wars movie. He really? appears in. Yes. Who counted? Somebody, oh come on, Star Wars fans are like, like nutty fans. Twitter accounts come on. dedicated Counting to you. Toes. <laughs> And yes, me count <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> and obviously, uh, we can't think of Han Solo without thinking of Harrison Ford, but apparently Al Pacino, Jack Nicholson, and Christopher Walken were also in the running for playing Han Solo. Well, Harrison is fine by me. Yasmin Kay, thank you for joining us. Okay. Gabby, thank you for joining us. That's it for this morning. Visit us on the web or on our Facebook page. And don't forget to join us again tomorrow to start your day every day. Next up are the headlines.